no such term. We all we really thought about was T cell and B cell and didn't really even call it adaptive immunity at that time. So this distinction between innate and adaptive, which we accept, and then all the immense complexity of the innate immune system is something that's just evolved pretty much over the last decade. Uh, Dilo, are you there? Do you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I do. And I see your slides starting. So most of the people here don't know you're new to the area and new to the faculty. So give them about 30 seconds on yourself and then go ahead. Sure. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year to everyone. My name is Talauer. I trained at the University of Michigan for my allergy and immunology fellowship. Uh, my clinical interests are drug allergy, food allergy, um, and vaccine allergy. Uh, and I think this topic, toll-like receptors, is pretty relevant to our current circumstance with COVID-19 pandemic and you know, all the vaccine development and complications with vaccines. And I think this is an excellent example of uh, bench to bedside, how understanding of basic immunology uh, can translate to clinical practice. And I also think it's a great topic to review for the fellows because this frequently shows up on board exams and is related to a number of things they might see in clinic. So I have no disclosures. I hope to put something on this slide one day, but not yet. Uh, so history of toll-like receptors. So between the 1980s and 1990s, um, a number of different groups in Europe and the U.S. identified the NF-kappa-B family of transcription factors in Drosophila melangastar, and they hypothesized a similar pathway in humans. In 1989, Janeway uh, defined features of uh, what we know to be pattern recognition receptors today. And in 1996, genetic analysis of Drosophila led to the discovery of toll protein. And it wasn't until 1997 that we described it in humans and the first toll-like receptor described in humans was TLR4, and that was shortly followed in 1998 and 1999 um, by the discovery of its ligand LPS. So what are pattern recognition receptors? They're germline encoded proteins that recognize conserved microbial products and initiate host defense. Uh, and then the two major products that they recognized are PAMPs and DAMPs. PAMPs are pathogen associated molecular patterns and DAMPs are danger associated molecular patterns. You can classify different pattern recognition receptors based on their structure. And leucine rich repeat containing um, pattern recognition receptors are two important ones, one of which are toll like receptors and the other are nod-like receptors. And our talk today will focus on toll-like receptors. So what are TLRs? There are family of receptors that recognize PAMPs and they initiate signaling pathways to activate innate immunity. They can also recognize products released by damaged cells and tissue to initiate an immune response to tissue injury as well. The location is cell surface and endosomal, and we'll get more into this later. They're germline encoded, and so they have limited diversity. So this is different from adaptive immunity and are often considered part of the innate immune system, as well as a bridge between innate and adaptive immunity. There are a total of 10 10 identified TLRs in humans. Uh, you may see 11 and 13 in the literature as well, uh, but those are described in mice only. So the restructures I was referring to earlier were these leucine-rich repeat motifs. This is a nice figure from Abbas's Cellular and Molecular Immunology. Uh, and you can see here uh, this cartoon of the leucine-rich repeat motif. So you have uh, leucine space throughout this structure, followed by asparagine at the end. Um, and in between, you can have a number of different amino acid combinations, and that's what allows the different types of toll-like receptors to be present. On the right here, you see two different uh, toll-like receptors next to each other, and this refers to their ability to either homodimerize or heterodimerize, and this further allows them to bind a variety of different products. For example, TLR2 and 6, the combination that heterodimer is needed to recognize peptidoglycan. And so you have a number of different ways in which toll-like receptors can interact with uh, different things based on their structure. So what are our TLR ligands? This is pretty important to know um, in terms of understanding which toll-like receptors are relevant to what type of pathogen, as well as something that's easily testable on board exams. And so this is something I think that's helpful to, to know when you're thinking about a patient and the types of infections that they might have, as well as something just to know for board assessment for fellows in the future. So TLRs 3, 7, 8, and 9 detect nucleic acids. Um, they're found on the endoplasmic reticulum um, and in the endosome. 
UNC 93B is required for proper endosomal localization. This is important because if you look at um, some of the things that these toll-like receptors bind in the table over here, you'll see, for example, single-stranded RNA. Um, and so how do we distinguish host RNA from pathogen RNA? And that's location. So normally the RNA from our host cells should not be present in the endosome. So it's critical for uh, the uh, toll-like receptors that recognize these type of um, uh, PAMPs and DAMPs to be present in the endosome. Otherwise, they won't be able to function appropriately because you want them to bind foreign, not host. TLRs 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 are found on the plasma membrane, so they're responsible for responding to extracellular PAMPs. So lipoarabinomannan is present on mycobacteria, so toll-like receptor 1 is important for the response to mycobacteria. Toll-like receptor 2 has heat shock protein 70, which is one of the DAMPs that I mentioned earlier, and so that's important for response to tissue injury. Toll-like receptor Receptor 4, which is one of the most well-studied uh, toll-like receptors, is uh, responsible for responding to LPS, which is present in gram-negative bacteria, as well as RSV fusion protein. Uh, so it's a critical in both viral responses and to response to gram-negative bacteria. Uh, what's not shown in this table here is that some of these toll-like receptors require accessory proteins in order to appropriately bind their PAMP or DAMP. Uh, an example of that is LPS requiring MD2 and CD14. Um, so it actually has to bind to a protein before that protein uh, PAMP uh, structure can then bind to the toll-like receptor and initiate an immune response. So this is a lot of information on this slide, um, but I like this figure from a boss because it kind of tells you the big steps in the signaling cascade uh, for toll-like receptors. So you have two big pathways, the MITE88 and the TRIF pathway. So MITE88 is responsible for activating NF-kappa B and AP1. This is an IL-1 receptor signaling pathway, and it's very critical to initiating a variety of Im immune responses, and it's involved in all TLR signaling except TLR3. And so you can see here, um, you know, these uh, extracellular TLRs that we mentioned earlier, one, two, five, and six, for example, and four is present here. You have binding of the bacterial PAMP to its toll-like receptor, which initiates a signaling cascade uh, using MITE88, and that in turn eventually leads to transcription of NF-kappa B, and the transcription of NF-kappa B then has a host of effects, including cytokine production, TNF, IL-1, IL-6. It can initiate production of chemokines, such as CXCL8, which is important for neutrophil responses. It affects endothelial adhesion molecule expression, E-selectin, so you help immune cells get into the tissue, and co-stimulatory molecules, including CD80 and CD86, so that second signal that's necessary um, for the APC to have the antigen presenting cell when it's trying to stimulate adaptive immunity such as T cells to initiate an immune response. And so the summation of this is a pro-inflammatory uh, response and stimulation of adaptive immunity. The other pathway, which is the TRIF pathway, uh, which is essential for toll-like receptor 3, uh, but can also be secondarily triggered by TLR4, uh, is important for inducing type 1 interferons. Uh, and so you have activation of interferon regulatory factor, that's what IRF stands for, resulting in expression of genes that result in the production of interferon alpha and beta. And then you have secretion of these interferons, which then result in an antiviral state. The cell in that schematic picture, is that a macrophage, is a prototypical cell? It's a prototypical cell. So toll-like receptors are found on a variety of cell types, um, not just um, immune cells, but pretty much any cell but endothelium. So type 1 interferons, this is going to be relevant to our discussion of uh, COVID-19 in a little bit, but it's a large family of structural related cytokines that are critical for an antiviral response. Um, again, another figure from a boss, which I think does a good job of um, summating the key steps here. Uh, so you have production of type 1 interferons in virus infected cells binding to the interferon receptor. Um, and then that in turn induces a number of different processes to fight the viral infection. And so you have inhibition of viral protein synthesis, degradation of viral RNA, and inhibition of viral gene expression and assembly, all things you would want to limit viral infection. And so when this pathway goes awry or you have derangements and in, um, interferon pathways, uh, you could see how that might lead to uh, increased uh, viral infection. So these are some TLR disease associations that have been described in the literature. Again, something that could show up on the boards. Um, and I think, you know, being medicine trained, uh, one of the things that we saw from time to time um, in the ICU was HSV encephalitis. 
Um, and that's been characterized by a number of TLR defects. And if you remember, 3, 7, 8, and 9 are the ones that are endosomal. And so it makes sense that um, a viral infection that would infect the inside of the cell um, would need these toll-like receptors to initiate an immune response to that type of organism. Uh, and so defects in this endosomal toll-like receptor pathway could predispose you to developing HSV encephalitis. And then recall that TLR4 can bind peptidoglycan, which is critical for um, response to fungal infection, including aspergillosis. TLR2 and 4 have been associated with adrenal insufficiency. TLR2 is associated with some mycobacterial infections. And then you can also have derangements, not in the toll-like receptor, but downstream in the signaling cascade, which functionally can lead to something similar. Uh, IRAC4 and MITE88 deficiency are associated with recurrent pyogenic bacterial infections. And MITE88 is critical for a number of toll-like receptors, including ones that are responsible for responding to bacterial products. NEMO is something that frequently shows up. Um, in discussion of immune deficiency, as well as on board exams, and you can have infection with mycobacterial susceptibilities. We won't get too much into that today, um, but certainly that is involved in this pathway as well. And then TLR agonists are used for topical treatment of viruses. We don't really use this as allergists, but our colleagues in dermatology do. So imiquimod and reziquimod can bind TLR7 and TLR8. So TLR agonist is adjuvants. Um, so MPL, which is detoxified form of LPS and is often found in aluminum salts. And I'm sure everyone here is familiar with aluminum being an adjuvant used in many vaccines. Um, and it's been used in herpes zoster, hepatitis B and HPV. So things that are um, you know, given to folks at a variety of different ages. And the presence of MPL is what helps initiate or augment that immune response uh, to these different things when you're trying to vaccinate an individual against them. It's been used as an adjuvant in cancer therapy. Um, so BCG, um, which relies on toll-like receptors two and four has been studied in the setting of bladder cancer. As I mentioned before, imiquimod and reziquimod um, rely on toll-like receptors seven and eight. And there's been a lot of exploration of using these as an adjuvant in a variety of cancer therapies. And CPG uh, oligonucleotides have been specifically studied in renal cell carcinoma. Uh, flagellin and small molecule agonists of TLR7 and 8 are also currently being studied as uh, vaccine adjuvants for a variety of applications. So um, to get to TLRs and coronavirus, which is why I think you know, our view of toll-like receptors is um, more timely in, given our current circumstance, Coronaviruses are single positive sense RNA viruses, and their fragments from SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS have all been shown to bind TLR7 and 8. In addition to this, TLR4 has been shown to have the ability to be activated by oxidized phospholipids, and these are present in viral lung infections. You also have neutrophil extracellular traps or nets, um, which are present in viral infection as well, um, and that can result in stimulation of toll-like receptors as well. And then TLR3 activation is is uh, critical for production of irifirm beta by macrophages. And so when you have derangements in this pathway, that can sometimes cause issues with response to coronavirus infection. So it's, there's a number of different toll-like receptors that can potentially play a role in the response to coronaviruses. So uh, depending on what paper you read, every toll-like receptor has been thought to have a potential role in COVID-19 infections. Some of the ones mentioned include 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9. TLR3 and TLR4 deficient mice have increased susceptibility to COVID-19 with an associated increase in mortality. TRIF deficient mice, remember that second pathway that I showed you apart from MITE88, have increased susceptibility and high risk of mortality to COVID-19 infection. TLR4 overactivation has been implicated in the pathogenesis of severe COVID-19. And this is, if you think of COVID-19, there's really two big phases. You have the initial infectious phase, and then for folks that go on to develop more severe disease and complications, you have an overactive immune response um, that is way more than what you would need to clear or control the infection and results to damage uh, to the surrounding tissue. Um, and so the thought is that maybe there's some overactivation of toll-like receptors and some of these really strong immune responses that become detrimental to the host. And then dysregulation of TLR7 and 8, remember these are the ones that directly bind the single-stranded RNA, has been proposed as both a mechanism for cytokine storm as well as severe COVID-19 infection in otherwise healthy patients. So just to get a little more into the weeds here, 
This is a, a nice figure looking at toll right receptor four immunity um, and how it can mimic bacterial sepsis in COVID-19. And so essentially you have toll like receptor four mediated signaling molecules that are upregulated by mononuclear cells from COVID-19 patients compared to healthy controls. And so what does that result in? If you have increased stimulation of toll like receptor four, that's gonna translate into more NF-kappa B activation. And as you recall from that figure I showed earlier, uh, you're gonna have a variety of inflammatory, pro-inflammatory processes in increased chemokines, increased cytokines, change in adhesion molecule expression. And so you're going to have a very robust immune response. Uh, and so what they showed here was that, uh, you know, you can get increased activation of toll-like receptor 4 with COVID-19 infection compared to healthy controls. And that this might be one of the mechanisms for why you had get such um, strong inflammatory response in severe COVID-19 infection. One of the other things that I thought was interesting um, in there's a lot of uh, immunometabolic research being done currently. That's one of the, I think, new frontiers in immunology is how uh, does the metabolism and processing of these cells change under a variety of different conditions. And, you know, you guys have probably heard before that obesity is described as an inflammatory state. And one of the thoughts of why obesity may be a risk factor for COVID-19 is this pathway. Because with obesity, you have increased expression of toll-like receptors. And if you get a viral infection like COVID-19, that can then activate all these toll-like receptors that are increased in expression and result in an overly robust immune response to the point where it's dentimentral and causes tissue injury. So this is one of the most well-characterized um, pathways with COVID-19 infection early on um, in 2020. Uh, this is done by our colleagues in Europe. And what, they, what it was was a case series of a pair of brothers in the Netherlands who were admitted to the ICU for severe COVID-19. Um, and they were aged less than 35 with no pre-existing conditions. You wouldn't predict that these folks would be high risk for COVID-19 infection. Um, and they did whole exome sequencing. They have that pipeline established um, in the Netherlands for these patients that get admitted to the ICU. And also they did available family members. And what they found was a loss of function variant in TLR7. And this resulted in uh, aberrancy and in interferon production after stimulation with imiquimod. So you showed functionally that this was a relevant mutation. Um, and this is one of the reasons they felt that these folks that had no risk factors and were pretty young ended up with such severe COVID-19 infection in the ICU and one of them actually died. Uh, and so this was the first example of how toll-like receptor signaling and immunology is relevant to COVID-19. How is it that they lived 35 years with no clinical clue that they had this genetic defect? So I think that that has a lot to do with um, the fact that toll-like receptor 7 is very specific to single-stranded RNA. Um, so I think you needed the right setup to reveal this defect. Um, certainly, uh, there are other viral infections um, that these folks probably got growing up. But um, as you recall, not all viral infections are RNA-based and rely on this toll-like receptor. For example, toll-like receptor 4 is what's necessary to respond to RSV. So I think that it was one of those things where they had this and were fortunate not to get an infection to stimulate this pathway. And then with the rise of COVID-19, that was kind of the worst possible setup for them. So just to get into the immunology a little bit more, these are the same pathways that I showed you before, uh, MITE88 and TRIF. And so when you have um, an absence of toll-like receptor 7 or decreased function of toll-like receptor 7, you're not going to get an appropriate response in the endosome to the SSRNA from SARS-CoV-2. And so you don't get binding, you don't get activation of MITE88, and you don't get these interferon regulatory factors produced. And in the absence of these factors, you don't produce the critical type 1 interferons that are necessary for the antiviral state. Um, and so this is why the, it's really hard to respond to SARS-CoV-2 in patients that have derangements in this pathway. So another thing I wanted to cover um, that I think is relevant uh, to COVID-19 and toll-like receptors is inborn errors of type 1 interferon immunity. Um, so Zhang et al. identified patients with severe COVID-19 who have mutations in genes involved in the regulation of type 1 and type 3 interferons. Um, and essentially what they found was an enrichment of loss of function 
and TLR3 and IRF7 dependent type 1 interferon immunity in about 3.5% of their cohort, which was 659 patients with that were unrelated and had severe COVID-19 infection. Folks that were in the ICU, had pneumonia, were oxygen dependent. Um, and they took these cells to the lab, the patient cells, and showed that with stimulation that you had decreased IRF7 expression and decreased type 1 interferon production. Um, and so they showed, you know, mechanistically that, you know, these mutations were relevant. And it kind of ties in nicely to that initial uh, work that I mentioned with the toll-like receptor 7, because those that pathway also affects uh, the interferon regulatory factors and interferon 1 type 1 expression. Here on the right is a figure from their paper um, looking at plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And for the fellows, these are one of the critical types of dendritic cells that are really important in response to viral infection. Um, and they show here that uh, with uh, TLR3 uh, mutations in that pathway that you get decreased production of the interferon regulatory factors, um, and then you have decreased production of type 1 interferons, and that in turn then um, causes a poor antiviral state. And plasma cytoid dendritic cells are, you know, very critical for um, telling the T cells and the rest of the immune system what to do. I think when I was first learning immunology, there was a lot of focus on the T cell directing the immune response. But I think there's an increasing appreciation now that uh, the dendritic cell is really one of the true master regulators of the immune system because it's the dendritic cell that presents to the rest of the immune system. This is a threat. This is what's going on. And then can polarize the immune system to act one way versus the other, depending on the type of dendritic cell and what interferons are released. Another thing that I think um, was very relevant to this um, is a study that was published at the same time um, by a different scientist in that same group. Um, and this was a, a gentleman who's actually presented at CIS and I attended his talk. I think this is an excellent work supporting the mechanism of uh, the interferon being causative in this severe uh, COVID-19 infection. So Bastard et al. identified individuals with high titers of neutralizing autoantibodies against type 1 interferon alpha 2. And in about 10% of these patients, they found these autoantibodies, so an enrichment of them. Um, and these are folks, again, with COVID-19 pneumonia, oxygen dependent in the ICU, very severe disease. And they also looked at autoantibodies in folks that were asymptomatic and had infection as well as healthy controls. And I believe they found antibodies only in one healthy control, um, but it was 10% of you know, the 600 patient plus cohort uh, that had these autoantibodies that had had severe COVID-19. And so for the fellows, this is an excellent example of a phenocopy where you have something that has the phenotype of a genetic disease but without the genetic mutation. And so uh, I think that this is a nice tie-in to the slide I just showed before, because both of these support the importance of interferon playing a role in response to COVID-19 and how derangements in that pathway can result in more severe infection. Uh, and so I think the two together support each other in terms of the mechanism. Um, and certainly this is an excellent example of understanding the concept of phenocopy, where again, you have the same phenotype, but in the absence of the genetic mutation. Yeah, that, you lost me here with the, uh, the relationship of this to TLR, or can you just explain these data a little better? For sure, for sure. Me? Yeah, so, um, you know, with the TLR derangements, you have a genetic defect that results in decreased expression of the interferon regulatory factors, and that in turn results in decreased interferon production, um, which hinders your ability response to viral infection. Um, and, uh, you know, to further support that that's the actual mechanism that's causing severe COVID-19 disease, they found these autoantibodies. So they functionally result in the same thing. In this case, the toll-like receptor is responding appropriately, but the end product of that stimulation and that pathway is not happening. So right at the very end stage where you're producing the interferon, it's getting neutralized by these autoantibodies. And so functionally, you're behaving like a toll-like receptor defect in that you aren't able to create the appropriate amount of interferon to stimulate uh, an antiviral state and immune response. And so what these autoantibody data support is that it's the absence of the interferon production or function um, that's resulting in this severe COVID-19 infection in many patients. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. So, but I mean, obviously if you're making autoantibodies, somehow there's an interplay of B cells in these people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a, an error in the adaptive immune system as well. Correct. Yes. Um, and uh, the reason I mentioned this here is just to show the importance of uh, interferon in the response to COVID-19 infection. All right. Well, thanks.
And so um, to kind of summarize, you know, how is this relevant to our future understanding of, you know, how we can treat disease um, and, you know, how can we apply this understanding to the patients that we see? Um, so this is a nice paper published on, you know, how we can take advantage of our understanding of toll-like receptors to combat COVID-19. Um, and so TLR antagonists and um, agonists are both being studied. And what I thought was really interesting, even though it didn't pan out, is that hydroxychloroquine seems to inhibit um, the uh, function of some toll-like receptors. Um, and also stimulation of toll-like receptors can potentially at the right point in disease, uh, help with clearing the virus as well. So again, going back to that concept of thinking of COVID-19 infections in kind of two phases, the first phase being the infectious phase where you initially acquire the virus, and the goal is really controlling the replication of the virus and clearing it as quickly as possible. And the second phase for those folks that go on to develop more severe disease is that a robust immune response to the point where you're causing tissue injury. So you could see where if you have overstimulation of toll-like receptors, you would want to consider a TLR antagonist to prevent something like cytokine storm, where early on, um, if you catch someone that has very minimal disease um, or very recently after acquiring infection or having symptoms and they haven't quite reached that um, immunity uh, dysregulation phase, maybe a low dose of a TLR agonist in that case might help you clear the virus in some patients. And so a really understanding um, the whether it's pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, um, and what phase to use it in in the disease process can be helpful, I think, in developing new therapies for these patients in the future. So that's all I have. Um, I know that was a, a whirlwind tour and, and a quite a brief presentation, um, but I think that this is an excellent example of uh, basic immunology, um, understanding that and translating it into what we're seeing in, in clinical practice. And our word of the day is new year. Well, thank you. Um, we obviously have uh, a brilliant understanding of this really complex field. I'm curious if you know, or any of our immunologists, I presume we have some rare patients in immunology clinic here who have mighty 88 deficiency or others that are relevant to these pathways. If anybody, any of them have contracted COVID, do we have any clinical experience locally with uh, how this um, how this pathway plays out in, in people with relevant diseases? So they've published, um... A, a PID cohort um, and kind of how they did with COVID-19. And um, as you can probably guess, it really depends on the type of immune defect that the patient has. My experience has been as folks with more um, defects in cell-mediated immunity um, tend to do worse because they have such a hard time clearing the virus without appropriate T-cell response. Um, but many of my patients with CVID, for example, um, are able to eventually clear the virus, although it's challenging, I think, because um, I don't know what the protocol is here, but at least at Michigan, you know, if you had immune deficiency and got COVID-19 infection, we had a clear pathway to get you monoclonal antibodies early on. Um, and so these patients are being aggressively treated sometimes up front too. So it's hard to say what the natural evolution of the disease would be, um, but I think it really varies based on, on the type of immune defect. Well, we have plenty of time. We have other questions out there. Allie, are you on? Do you have any experience over at Children's? Is she listening? I'm not sure. I have a question. Go ahead, Art. Um, most immunodeficiencies that happen at a young age, but the young, those who get COVID at a young age typically do a lot better with COVID. Is there a reason for that? So I think it has to do perhaps with the um, acquisition of uh, comorbidities over time. Um, so as I mentioned with the immunometabolics, you know, with obesity, hypertension, diabetes, um, some of these metabolic diseases, um, they do affect the immune system. And uh, one of the proposed mechanisms for why they may be risk factors is that increased expression of toll-like receptors. So I think with children, perhaps some of them um, haven't developed those comorbidities um, that are that uh, make it much more difficult to treat in the adult population. And one of the other theories um, is these autoantibodies develop over time. Um, the older you are, the more likely you are to have autoantibodies. 
uh, at least based on the data that I've seen um, and from that cohort that I mentioned with the interferon autoantibodies. So perhaps um, these children just haven't had times to develop uh, some of those derangements that acquire those autoantibodies that are problematic. So those are two of the mechanisms that I could potentially think of that might explain. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. One, I've always wondered where the term toll-like receptor, what that has to do with Drosophila in this whole chain of uh, history of naming these things. And the other comment, I'm wondering if any of our fellows, I don't see Ali is on the line, but our fellows who rotate through immunology clinic at Children's, have you seen any uh, patients with especially uh, innate or toll-like receptor deficiencies contract COVID? Go ahead with the first answer. I don't have uh, an answer for why they're called toll other than perhaps the work was very grueling and took quite a toll on the investigators. And perhaps that's why they named it as such, but I don't have a good answer for that. All right, that's clever, but it's not correct. <laughs> Any of our fellows want to pipe up? Um, at least, and this is Karen, at least during our first year, I don't recall having any patients that had any TLR um, abnormality. I think actually most of our immunodeficiency patients on the PEDS side have done relatively well with COVID infections. Um, so I really cannot think of an example. Um, maybe the first years can chime in, but our yeah, patients have done really well. I can't think of any. I've had the same experience too. I haven't had any yeah. patients with any innate. I think it's just that they're... They're so rare to begin with. So most of our immunodeficiency patients that have contracted COVID are humoral immunodeficiency. Yeah, my experience is consistent with the humoral immune deficiency folks doing well, even on the adult side. Um, Cause I think really for viral infection, you know, it's the, the T cells that play a big role like the CD8 T cells, for example. And as long as their cell mediated immunity is intact I think a lot of them do very well. So I think what you're really alluding to is the redundancy of the immune system, even if you had a defect in an innate immunity or adaptive immune system is sufficient most of the time. Most of the time, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we have 35 smart people listening to you here. Anybody else with a comment? Well, 34 smart people, I won't include myself. Hi, this is Sally Nubro, and I had a question about the autoantibodies to interferon. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, commercially available tests to look for this, and is that something that's done? So that's an excellent question. I know that that's something that uh, the folks are, are working on, um, but as far as I'm aware in the United States, uh, I'm unaware of uh, easily available commercial tests for interferon autoantibodies. Um, but that's certainly something I could uh, look into further, but I have not seen an order on any patients in, in my clinical practice or I'm aware of a, a clinically available test right now. I think this is mostly on a research basis. Okay, anybody else before we wrap up early? In which case, for the fellows, we'll just start board review early. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, excellent way to introduce yourself to our broader community. I know we're all still waiting for the day that we can actually assemble in a room together. Um, that seems more and more problematic uh, all the time. But thanks again for a brilliant presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a good morning and rest of the day. Bye-bye.